right. So, okay, folks, want to talk about one of the, of course, the big things you talk about on the campaign trail is reparations uh, for the black community. And I just want to tell our listeners, certainly in America, we've actually, you know, this has always been discussed in terms of the black community going back to slavery. We actually have... Um, uh, the internment of Japanese Americans uh, during World War II. Afterwards, there was um, over 20,000 paid to reparations, over 800,000 victims of the internment. Uh, over a billion was actually initially allocated. An additional 400,000 was appropriated later to cover claims. Globally, in 1952, as you have mentioned, Jesse, Germany paid over $89 billion in reparations to victims of the Holocaust during World War II. Uh, German officials continued to meet with groups of survivors and their advocates to revisit guidelines and ensure that survivors receive the benefits. So it has happened on a global level. On a city level, uh, Jesse and uh, Akile, how, did, how would this work out? Yeah, yeah well, I really appreciate um, you, know, you saying that because reparations isn't just some um, concept that we've created, but it's something that's already been discussed and it's happening worldwide. And it's been a demand from the black community um, for, you know, since the existence of this entire social system and this U.S. government came at the expense of the enslavement of African people and the genocide of the indigenous people on this land. And so reparations isn't just some you know, some abstract thing, but it's real, it's been happening, and we can do it right here in the city of St. Pete. And just like the city of St. Pete, um, and every other city, state, and place in this country, throughout the U.S., has come, um, has come into existence as a result of that reality of enslavement and genocide. And so it would just make sense that reparations to the black community should be on, you know, all, anybody who says they wants to represent a body of people, it would be on, you know, the tongues of everybody, reparations, justice to the black community, acknowledging this historical crime has been committed right. against the black community. So, you know, reparations looks like prioritizing the budget and centering reparations and economic development at the center for the black community. And it looks like, um, in particular instance of reparations, is a Tropicana Field baseball dome uh -huh. in St. Pete that was built on the displacement of the gas plant district, which was the oldest. Um, well, let me ask you, Keith, what, yeah. what would you um, a lot of talk about, of course, the temporary raids, mm -hmm. whether they will leave that site or not. Mayor mm -hmm. uh, Christman wants them to come back to that area. They may very well not, though. They, they, the city has this plan, this master plan to yeah. redevelop those 85 mm -hmm. acres. You would say, no, do something with the black community centered there. Right. Um, yeah, Kreisman, he wants the race to stay, and also there's talks about a, a soccer stadium. Right. And we're saying that this dome represents a beacon of gentrification. It represents the destroying of a black community, and it represents the destruction of a livelihood of a community. And we're saying that we want to turn that land over back to the black community. There's parking lots for that dome that are paved over a graveyard. That's a crime. And that in order to address that crime, you say we say we need to return that land back to the black community and build affordable housing and economic development for the black community. That's yeah. Let me ask you, Jesse. Actually, it's okay. So I want to move on. Um, I mentioned this to the other candidates. Charlie Gertis this morning said uh, he's hearing a lot of. I don't think the word was misinformation, but something about not accurate information from some of the candidates on the trail regarding affordable housing, as if the city is doing. Well, I don't think he would think the city's doing enough, but but certainly you and not and all the candidates are basically saying that a lot more needs to be done. What would you do in terms of affordable housing if you were a mayor of St. Petersburg? Well, um, for one, we would bring gentrification to a screeching halt because, you know, you can't talk about affordable housing without talking about the fact that what's happening in St. Petersburg today is an expansion of the gentrification that was put in place by previous mayors, including one of the other candidates, Rick Baker, that under the guise of revitalization of quote-unquote Midtown, which is a name that Baker gave to the south side of St. Pete, the majority black population of the south side of St. Pete, to justify expanding downtown from the waterfront to 34th Street and basically displacing black communities and gentrifying the South Side. And Kreisman ran on the promise that he would continue the legacy of Rick Baker with regards to so-called Midtown, and he has. But just to go back yep. for a second to the question of reparations, um, I did want to say that my platform in this uh, mayor's race has been unity through reparations because we believe that the only way to unite the city of St. Petersburg, which is a very divided city, where you have, you have two St. Pete's, basically, uh, is through reparations and economic development for the black community. And like you said, reparations has been a very popular uh, discussion throughout the world. 
including reparations to black people for what for the crimes that have been committed by this government, by this system. In fact, in 2001, the United Nations held a world conference in Durban, South Africa, where slavery and colonialism were declared crimes against humanity, and it was stated that reparations were owed to black people. So we are excited about bringing St. Petersburg into this discussion that's been happening all over the world. And when we first entered this race, it was there was an article in Creative Loafing that said St. Petersburg is regarded as generally a progressive city, and then it had a parenthesis, with the exception of long-standing economic injustice plaguing the black community on the south side. And what we have said with this campaign is that that is a contradiction in terms to say progressive except for right. injustice against right. the black community. Right. Like the cornerstone of a genuinely progressive agenda, a genuinely progressive stance, including if not especially for white people, is a commitment to reparations to the black community. Well, let's talk about reparations, and I know after Paul Kajemi made his uh, outrageous comments last week, uh, uh, that you said, though, Jesse, uh, that what he said, and, and we don't need to repeat it, uh, but nevertheless, that Rick Baker and Rick Kreisman, um, because they haven't called for reparations, are just like Paul Kajemi. Now, uh, Mama T. Lassiter or Anthony Cates, I don't believe they've talked about reparations either. Is that unfair to basically say, call the two Ricks out on, on that, comparing them to Paul Kajemi, because they haven't said they need we city needs reparations for black people in St. Petersburg. No, I don't think it's unfair. I think it's actually a really generous, uh, mild assessment, actually, because there are no words that Paul Kajemi could scream into a microphone that could cause as much damage to the black community of St. Petersburg as the policies of Rick Baker and the policies of Rick Kreisman. And name one of them that you say is as offensive as saying blacks should go back to Africa. Well, for one, the public policy of police containment, where under Rick Baker, you had the street crimes unit wreaking havoc and terror against the black community. You had uh, Pinellas County Sheriff's Department and St. Pete Police murdering black teenagers like Javon Dawson, Markel McCullough, Jarrell Walker, and under the Kreisman administration, you have the same thing with the three drowned black girls, Dominique Battle, Ashanti Butler, and Lanaya Miller, who were uh, sadistically pushed into a pond and drowned by the Sheriff's Department with not a word of protest or condemnation from the Kreisman administration, although that happened within his city limits. And, yeah. Now, now Keyway, speaking about that, you said you want the black community to run its own police force. How, how would that work out? I mean, isn't that kind of unrealistic? Mm, no, uh, I live in black community control of the police and the ability for a democratically elected board to be able to hire, fire, train, and discipline the police that should function within the black community as public servants of the people and they're actually people that live in that community that have a stake in what's going on in that community and I think that that should be the most realistic, that's the most democratic just demand for the black community and that should be more realistic than police murders of black children and that should be the unrealistic factor that the police can function as an occupying military force within the black community that should be the question of what it should be unrealistic so though again there'd be a black police chief separate chief and separate department inside the just the whole city i mean well, trying to figure that the out. whole police the way the police function, again, as a military occupying force, the police are an arm of the state, and the state exists as a result of a, the current social system, and the social system rests on an economic base of colonialism and slavery. And the state has come into existence as a result of this reality and to protect those who have from those who don't have because those who have have it at the expense of those who don't. So with the, the whole divided St. Pete, and you know that there's you know wealth within the white community and economic despair within the African community. That's why the police are necessary within St. Pete. So with black community control of the police and reparations and economic development for the black community, not only are we saying black community control of the police, but we're saying the whole function of the police in general has to be deconstructed because it's a relationship of terror imposed on the black community to facilitate policies of Baker and Kreisman, of gentrification, of you know big condo and high rises being built for paradise for the rich at the expense of the poor and working class black community and the people of the city. And we're speaking of the Tequila Canyon. She is running for the District 6 City Council race uh, with the Uhuru Party and Jesse Neville, who's a Uhuru candidate for mayor here in, in St. Petersburg as well. I'm Mitch Perry. It's 1245 in the afternoon. You're just tuning in to Midpoint here on WMNF. We're here till 1 p.m. talking to these candidates here. Of course, the early voting is going on right now for the August 29th election. Jesse, let's go back. Actually, Keely, 
get both way on this, but there's actually an article in the Times, I believe it was yesterday or today, about District 6 and about how it is, used to be a majority black district and now it no longer is. And we're really seeing it play out in this election in a way. Uh, you've got three black candidates, five white candidates. Um, part of it is in midtown, part of it is north downtown. Really bifurcation of the city happening in this campaign. Uh, I know there's talk about you know redistricting this after the next census here, uh, but uh, this was a, a, a black seat basically, right, for so many years mm -hmm. until, until Carl Nurse was named back in 2008. Mm -hmm. You've been very critical of Carl Nurse. Yes, I have. Why? Because Carl Nurse is responsible for what it is that you're talking about in terms of you know the. District 6 being a majority black district, and now it's not. And you're talking about a city where that's majority white. And, you know, districts, and you're talking about this whole election, electoral process in general. Yeah. And you have the primary and the general elections, and the primary is supposed to function as a single member district election. You're in a majority white city, and so the only chance that the black community has, you know, are for these districts and these district representatives. Right, the fact that it, it, CP is very weird like that, where you have these district elections, and then in you know, August, and then everybody gets to vote in November. That's not like that in Tampa, or Pinellas County, or Hillsborough County. It or... vetoes the black vote, right. and there's no voice for the black community, and with this whole redistricting and Jerry gerrymanderings, that's what it's called, gerrymandering the district, you further, you know, know the voice of the black community. There is no representative. There's there's not even a black community there. And it's not just gerrymandering, but it's gentrification. It's the forced displacement of black people out of our communities and even out of the city. And I'm very critical of Carl Nurse because he's the Trojan horse for gentrification within District 6. And he's been a part of this, you know, fierce policy of, you know, just gerrymandering the district, gentrification with this community redevelopment area. And to you don't like the South Side CRA? I hate the South Side CRA. <laughs> the South Side CRA is gentrification. It look, it's big money. Carl Nurse earns four plots of land in the CRA. He profits off of high property taxes. He profits off of this whole process. It's gentrification. It's nothing but it's welfare economics. I'm saying reparations and genuine economic development for the black community, not, you know, this thing that the city decides to throw at the black community's crumbs that they shove off the table that doesn't even mean anything for the black community because the Democratic Party used it for landscaping funds and resources are going to downtown for art pool gallery and all these places that do not benefit the black community is gentrification. Jesse, let's talk about your race. Actually, if I could for a moment, I wanted to get away from the issues, talk a little, a little bit more about both of you guys. Jesse, you're 27, right? Are you, did you grow up in St. Pete? Tell me a little more about your background. Sure, I grew up in Miami, actually, and I moved here when I was 18. I moved to St. Pete, and I met the Uhuru movement in 2010. I saw Chairman Omali Chatella speak at University of South Florida, where I was going to school at the time. And I saw him talk about the history of his work in St. Petersburg and around the world, fighting for black liberation and fighting for reparations to the black community. And I learned about the famous incident where he tore down the racist mural from the wall of City Hall um, that continues to be a blank space on that wall 50 years later today, and for which he was jailed and forced to work on a chain gang. And I was very inspired by that. And I joined the movement as a result of that, and joined the Uhuru Solidarity Movement which is an organization of white people that works under the chairman's leadership and under the leadership of the Uhura movement and organizes for reparations and raises resources in material solidarity with black community economic development projects. Are your, your parents, were they uh, progressive? At, you know, what was their background like? I mean, did you learn stuff from them at all or how did you form your political identity, if, if you will? Well, I, I mean, my, my parents are definitely supportive of, of what I'm doing and, and um, you know, I grew up, my family was Jewish, so, uh, there were a lot of politically active people in my family, but um, I don't think I ever truly understood what it meant to be a part of a movement that could change the world until I met the Uhuru movement. And, you know, my parents are, are very much on board and have been supportive of this campaign. And one thing I did want to mention, um, earlier you were referring to uh, the Uhuru candidates, and, you know, I don't mind that label. In fact, I wear it with a badge of honor. Um, but I do want to point out that the, the St. Pete mayoral and district races are technically nonpartisan. That's correct. Um, so, you know, That's where, whereas we are constantly referred to as the Uhuru candidate. Well, I, I, I outed uh, Robert Blackman as a Republican right. for supporting okay. Baker. So but normally you don't hear that. But I will say that as the Uhuru candidate, I really appreciate the support of many Democrats who are leaving the Democratic Party to come support our campaign. You uh, said you said that uh, and white people have come up to you and said they're going to vote for you, but they don't want to publicly yes. admit that? 
And we, we are urging any pe any anyone out there and any white person that says, oh, I support this campaign, but I have to do it privately, to come out of the closet and be courageous in this last month. Come out of the reparations closet. Don't be afraid to stand in solidarity with justice for the black community. And that's why I want to mention, you know, people from the Democratic Party, we've been endorsed by the Green Party. Um, we've received widespread support. and. You know, people are leaving Christman's campaign in droves to support us, so I guess he's not enough of an approved droves. candidate. Yeah, definitely. Well, I guess we'll see you on August 29th. Yeah. Um, Akiwe, you, I think I've read something about your dad being an activist, is that correct? Well, he's been a long member of the Uhuru movement, and that's where I was introduced into political life, and just even in the beginning, he was summing up the political contradictions I saw around me. And so it helped me to form, you know, my opinions growing up, and after I graduated high school, I had the chance to go off to New York to go to college, but I realized that there was no better place for me than right in the city of St. Pete and fighting, um, enjoying the Uhura movement and fighting for, you know, the liberation for economic and social justice for the black community, for my people. And so that's where I just, you know, I... I was like, okay, all right, bye, and I invested and, all my time. And you went to St. Pete College? Is that uh, Saint, yeah, St. Pete Collegiate. Right. So I graduated high school and then with my AA as well. So. Um, okay, well, great. I wanted to get more information about where you guys came from. Let's go back to the issues. Jesse, you're calling for the city uh, to impose a five-year moratorium. Excuse yes. me, five-year moratorium on a high-rise construction in downtown St. Petersburg. Yes. We're certainly seeing a lot of development. Is it too much development going on downtown? It's too much development at the expense of the people. And we're, we're seeing St. Petersburg, we're seeing the waterfront is basically being privatized for the private enjoyment of the rich. They are overrunning the skyline with high rises. Every time you turn around, you see another New York billionaire real estate developer like John Katzmatitis buying up huge swaths of land in downtown St. Pete. And we say that we need a five year moratorium on any more high rise construction so we can focus on genuine economic development and so we can focus on fixing the sewage infrastructure because all of that development increases the waste that is generated on an already strained sewage and stormwater infrastructure that hasn't been repaired since 1972. So while they're talking about making these repairs, they're also increasing the waste that's being put on this system and that makes absolutely no sense. So we want a five year moratorium minimum so we can prioritize the people of this city and the public health and economic development. You have also talked about decriminalizing drug addiction in St. Petersburg. Um, what should happen in St. Pete? I know Tampa has decriminalized marijuana. Has St. Pete done that? No. Okay, so that's, that's something that should be, I think, when we think of a progressive city like St. Pete. Um, has Rick Chrysler done anything that you're, you can say that, good job, Rick? No. <laughs> Not at all. Okay. All right. Um, Akiva, let's go back to you. Uh, in District 6 here, uh, you have talked about, let's see here, um, uh, you both have been very critical, uh, just as the other candidates have, about the pier, in terms of the escalating costs of the St. Petersburg Pier. Um, what would you do there? Would you, I mean, again, it's already, the construction's beginning now, mm -hmm. $66 million, I believe it is, has been invested so far, they're talking about more. Mm -hmm. um, what would you do? I mean, just to stop it right now, and I mean, it, I mean, yeah, cease the beer. I mean, there's so many things that can be done in the city of St. Pete, and there's so many things that the people are demanding, like affordable housing and to fix the sewage infrastructure and all these different things that are coming from the people. And the majority concern throughout the community is not, you know, this pier. It's, I want a place to live. You know, I need, I need resources. I need a job. I'm a convicted felon, and I have no rights, and I have no ability to actually live here in the city. I'm homeless and I can't live in a tent because <laughs> I'm afraid to get slashed and I'm afraid of Kreisman doing a sweep of Williams Park. So all these different things that the people are saying and you know, this whole focus on a pier is literally the status quo talking amongst themselves about what should happen to something that they get to enjoy. There's also been a discussion about a noise ordinance and in one of the debates you mm -hmm. just joked, you laughed at that. You thought that was ridiculous. You yeah. said the black community's on fire and here we're talking about noise. But it's a quality of life thing, is it not? It's a quality of life thing. Well, I also said if you stop building bars and investing resources building bars downtown and that would reduce the noise. And you um, think that's just too much of that is happening? I, I mean, if you go downtown, what is, like, downtown St. Pete, bikes, bars, coffee, like, that's it, and that's, like, gentrification, that's all, you know what's coming if you see another brewery, if you see another coffee shop, that's it. So I'm saying if you um, invest resources and reparations and economic development um, to the black community, you know, that could, you know, 
probably change some of that as well. But I, you know, I did say that jokingly because I'm talking about the majority of the people are not complaining about a noise ordinance. You know, for those who don't get to enjoy the lavishes of the waterfront and downtown and everything like that, they're not bothered by the noise of, you know, what's happening downtown. They're bothered by the noise of police sirens in their community. They're bothered by this, you know, just this, they're bothered by the sounds of despair and poverty and homelessness and gentrification. That is what is plaguing the black community and affecting everybody in the city of St. Pete. You have also talked about rent control measures, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, seemingly that is an issue here, obviously, in terms of the escalating cost to live in St. Mm -hmm. Petersburg. Uh, in, in why hasn't that happened so far, you think? I mean, it seems like that would be something. It's, it's tough these days, but I mean, where I come from, San Francisco, that is a very pro-tenant city. It's one of the few maybe in the country that's like that. New York has famously rent control measures here. We don't have that in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. Well, it's gentrification. And, you know, with rising costs in rent, that's the whole process of gentrification. You can't afford your home. You can't afford to live where you are anymore. So now you're forced to go. And there's also we've also said returning Tropicana Field back to the black community to build affordable housing and economic development. When there are no... Like when there is not an abundance of housing for the people, then you see the rates of housing go up. If you create more affordable housing in the city of St. Pete, that deflates the housing costs for everyone throughout the city. And we're also saying that we have to redefine what affordable housing even means. And because now it's 80% of the AMI, and we're saying, you know, we were endorsed by New York State Assemblyman Charles Barron. And, you know, he was um, the councilman for his district. And he actually called to gentrification and increased the black population by 13% in his district by, you know, redefining affordable housing by 30% of the AMI. And we're saying that that's, it's, we can bring that right here in the city of St. Pete because 80% of your AMI is ridiculous. 54% of an average black family's income is going towards rent. That's insane. And we have to redefine what affordable even means. We are speaking with Akila Kenyon, and who's running for District 6 City at St. Pete City Council. Jesse Neville is running for mayor in St. Petersburg. Folks, let's, uh, before we wrap up, we only have a couple minutes left to go. We, we haven't really had any debates in the last few weeks. It looks like we're not going to. Oh, yes. No, they canceled it. Uh, yeah. On that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, the last one, which uh, which I think was kind of a farce in a way, uh, not only were just the, the mayoral debates, only Kreisman and Baker invited, but also only Baker and Kreisman's supporters, mm -hmm. which were, uh, you know, over half the audience, the auditorium there at the Palladium was empty uh, right. last week ago Tuesday. Yeah, many supporters. <laughs> yeah, and as we know, St. Petersburg College said they didn't want to be a sponsor to that because they thought that, that it was not democracy now action um how do we what do your guys feelings now i know let's i'm gonna say this because i've been also in one of the debates and you basically have not done anything different than any other candidate your supporters have been very boisterous let's put it that way that's been you know what, what people were unhappy about in some of the events and then we have the, the one breakdown at the end which uh actually mama t lassiter was the one yelling at a, a member of the audience there um have you what's been the feedback i know you're talking so much about the, the, the positive things that you've heard but you, you've got you must have had some people like some negative stuff have come at you over the, over the last month or so. Well, from the Tampa Bay Times and other corporate media, certainly. Susan McGrath. Um, <laughs> yes, and from from the chair of the Pinellas County Democratic Party, Susan McGrath, and and the uh, president of the Suncoast Benevolent Police Association, who referred to us and the Uhuru movement as domestic terrorists. Now, uh, McGrath says she never said that herself. Uh, oh, there's, I don't evidence. Know, there's evidence. Um, she definitely yeah, said it. Definitely. Okay, all right. Yeah. But ne nevertheless, uh, so uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say that y you're completely right that the last debate was a farce, quote unquote debate. We call it the Jim Crow debate. They had Christ, uh, Rick Christman and Rick Baker on stage in an auditorium that was nearly empty. They excluded me from participating and the other candidates, despite the fact that in the past they've had everyone, even Paul Jenny, was invited to the televised debate in 2009. But because you have a candidate talking about reparations to the black community and talking about fighting against big money and ridding the whole corrupt political establishment of these criminals that are occupying City Hall, they don't want that to be heard by tens of thousands of people. So they did not allow me to participate in that debate. And then they didn't even allow people who support us to sit in the audience. So that was a farce. And I do want to challenge Christman and Baker to debate me. And if you would even have all of us on this show, I'd be happy to debate Rick and Rick right here in this room on WMNF. I don't think anyone should have a problem with doing that. You know, the people of the Tampa Bay area have the right to hear all of the candidates that are running and have, especially have the right to hear candidates who are talking about representing the interests of the people and not the interests of big money, which is what both of those candidates represent. Uh, that is Jesse Neville. And then we've got about 30 seconds left for you, Akili. Give her your last comments here about your candidacy. Right. I just want to say, you know, our 
you know, the people of this movement, this people's movement in our campaign are extremely enthusiastic and it's unfortunate that no amount of money that Baker can pay his supporters can bring about this type of enthusiasm that the people have for these campaigns because it's two candidates who are fighting for a future for the people of the city and the future for the black community. And that's something that people can get behind. We've heard people say, I've never voted in an election, but this is the election, I'm going to do it. Because there's a revolution happening in St. Pete, and that's going to reverberate throughout the entire country. She is Akilah Kanyan. She's running for District 6 City Council right now in St. Petersburg. Early voting is going on. Jesse Neville running for mayor. Thank you folks for coming in the studio this afternoon. We really appreciate that. That's going to be it for us. Here we go. Next, we have Mr. Jesse Neville candidate for mayor of St. Petersburg and Miss, is it Miss or Miss, Miss, Miss? Look, 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 look at what she said, look. And that's all I care about, like, Miss Akili Now look, Kanan, I love that last name. Walter, I, I'll be totally honest with you. I can ask Jesse questions. I don't think I can ask. <laughs> that's all right, we got you, we got you, we got you. We got you, we're gonna, we're gonna interview him at the same time. I know her father. And he's been full disclosure. Yeah, full disclosure. Full disclosure. Full disclosure. I know her father. Sure, I, man, I was like from the else. side, know her since she was like ten or eleven years old, else. Don't say else. doing all the hoodoo stuff. So it's it's you know, I, I I'll try to ask like a tough question, but I'm not gonna say anything afterwards. There'll be no commentary. I'm just gonna throw it out there and, and let it <laughs> and let it. But Jesse, I'm gonna give you the business. Okay. So right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's just terrible, man. All right. I don't know his dad. I don't know. <laughs> He's a nice guy. <laughs> oh, he said that was racist. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No, uh, no, y'all don't know. Jesse, Jesse Neville is of the John B variety. He's, he's not a. He's, he's yeah. He's he's not a pretender or anything like that. He's, uh, Jesse, you don't know who John B is. You mean John Brown? No. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. oh no, 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 no soliloquies or no monologues. No monologues, things that please don't. All right, all right. We so got, we literally have 23 minutes. All right. for everything left before one. So yeah. You ready? No. All right, Doc. Go ahead. Get all right, Mr. Neville. I'll ask you the same question that I asked um, candidate Cates. Mm -hmm. Because of the political atmosphere that we've seen with this particular election, we've seen that things are not quite as open and democratic as they have appeared. Uh, from media bias, media outlet bias and coverage, invitations to debates and so on and so forth. As a forced outsider candidate, mm -hmm. do you feel that the city of St. Petersburg, the residents and the, uh, the political class are ready to engage in non-traditional democratic republican rhetoric based politics for you to be able to effectively run for political office yes absolutely the people are definitely ready the people have been ready mm -hmm. and that's why at every single debate that happened that i was invited to or that akile was invited to the people in the audience were so overwhelmingly ready for something radically different from, from anything that's ever come before, that the people themselves, the audience, came under attack by the media. And after excluding me from participating in the only televised debate on, that was held at the Palladium, they even kept the people out and made it invitation only and canceled having an open audience. So the people are ready. And as you mentioned, I'm running for mayor in this election, along with Akile for District 6, and we're running against big money. We're running against the two big money corporate puppet politician candidates, Baker and Christman, who both represent the same agenda. They both represent gentrification. They both represent police containment of the black community. They both represent big development at the expense of the neighborhoods. And the people hate them. The people are sick of it. And the people want something new. And that's why the response to these campaigns has been so overwhelmingly enthusiastic from the very beginning. Mm. Well, all right, we are, uh, despite Trying to make it sexy in the background, really. <laughs> we'll continue. We'll continue to move forward because I don't think anybody knows where that's coming from. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that baby face moment for my R&B fans out there. Uh, <laughs> okay. So secondly, then there is a common thread that I'm noticing uh, um, in 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 terms of how your your campaign is covered. Mm-hmm. Please explain to me why you are more than a white puppet of the Uhurus who is here simply to yell and scream and, 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 and cause difference and not necessarily to win. Well, I would rather be a white puppet of the Uhurus than a puppet of big corporations and you know real estate developers, which is what uh, Chrysler and Baker are. So kind of all right with that criticism or quote unquote criticism. <laughs> but the point is not to scream and make noise. The point is to win. And that has been the point from the very beginning. And I've had the honor of working under the leadership of the Uhuru movement for almost 10 years and working in the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, whose job is to organize in my community, in the white community, and win other white people to stand in solidarity with black liberation, with reparations to the black community. And that's why I'm the only candidate in the mayor's race that has any experience on the question of reparations, which has been the center of our platform from the moment we started this race. We talk about unity through reparations to the black community, that the only way we can unite the entire city of St. Petersburg and move forward with a genuinely progressive agenda is to start by rectifying the longstanding injustices and oppression imposed upon the black community. Well, that's, that's well, Jesse, that's um, reparations in most people's eyes uh, are handouts. How do you feel about saying that the center of your campaign is just about giving black people handouts? Well, I've never heard anyone say that the German government gave handouts to the Jewish people after what happened with the the Nazi Holocaust. I've never heard anyone say that the U.S. government gave handouts to the Japanese after the internment of Japanese people during the Second Imperialist War. Mm -hmm. So reparations are not handouts. Reparations is acknowledgement of a crime that's been committed against a people by a government and repairing the damage, righting the wrongs. Mm, all right. Okay. Good. Uh, we have two phone calls. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. There's a couple. If you want to call in, call in eight one three two three nine nine six six three. Come get some. That's all I can say. Oh, come get some. Eight one three two three nine nine six six three. We came come on. Get some while, while you were gone, Babyface came on and screamed. Oh yeah, yeah. Jazz, yeah. 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 So yeah. All right. whip appeal. Actually. We have. Oh really? We <laughs> have Danny you. on Saint from Saint Pete. All right, Danny. How you doing? Welcome to the Sunday Forum. You have. Go direct to your question. Go direct to your question there. All right. Thanks, Walter. All right, now. Uh, yeah, I, I wish all the mayoral candidates could have been on here to answer this question. Uh, my question is, after the continued and repeated abuses uh, perpetrated against students in the public school system, uh, how do the two candidates uh, stand on keeping SROs, or school resource officers, in public school? Mm. Okay. All right. Well, there, there actually was, uh, thank you, Danny, for that question, and there actually was a debate, the last debate that happened at City Hall before they canceled all the other debates, uh, was uh, a debate where all of the mayoral candidates were asked, do you support keeping police in schools? Because that's what we're talking about when they come this is school resource officers, we're talking about cops right. that are put in, especially into predominantly black schools. And there has even been a lawsuit filed by the Southern Poverty Law Center against the Department of Education for you know horrific offenses committed by these cops against black children within the Pinellas uh, County public education system. And every single candidate up there on that platform said yes and I was the only candidate who said, hell no, that I'm absolutely opposed to the presence of police on schools. Right, right. right. Uh, Akila? Oh. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. We want, we want to hear from you. We want to know what your thoughts are. Yes, thank you. And just on that question, um, in terms of you know police on school campus, definitely no, hell no to the police on school campus. And that the police function on school campus as they do within the black community and that is to occupy and criminalize the black community and black children and there was an incident last year that happened where um, two teenaged um, black girls were approached by um, police officers on school campus for wearing head wraps and that was criminalized and you go into the student code of conduct and they're saying you know that it, it, it 
head wraps are as intolerable as, you know, guns and violence and drugs on school campus. So how does African culture and expressing that culture relate to guns and violence and oh, drugs? Oh, they did that too over there, right? Yeah, they, and, wow. and this was on Gibbs, that was at Gibbs High School, and these two uh, girls were approached by police officers, and that's an intimidation tactic. I'm armed to the teeth, and I'm telling you to take off your head wrap. And so I actually went to that school, and we organized a press conference, and an entire viral um, campaign came out of it called Black Girls Rap Wednesday, and it was where um, to rebel against that oppressive policy against black children, it was, you know, all I mean, girls were wearing their head wraps every Wednesday, and boys even stood in solidarity with the black girls and wore their dashikis, and the culture was expressed. And so this type of police containment has to end on police campuses, I mean, on, on school campuses. And yeah, that's what they seem like, police campuses. Yeah, campus police campuses, campus, it really does. There was an article by um, a student going to Gibbs, because um, school starts next week, and it was titled Back to Jail. And we really wow. have to listen to the voices of the children on that campus, wow. because that's what their experience is. It's prison. It's getting, it's, you know, they say um, from preschool to prison pipeline, that's the reality for black children on school campus. It, that is not, that is not a, um, a bit of hyperbole at all. I work with 5,000 role models of guys at Gibbs High School. In one, of the, in one of the meetings that we had in the spring, every single one of the boys there said, this place is like prison. Mm -hmm. It looks like prison. Mm -hmm. The lack of windows, the brick walls, the steel that is running there. You start acting like it. Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, this is, this yeah. is, this was, these were 16 yeah. or 17 year old black boys. Yeah. And they were saying, well, we already feel like we know a little bit about prison. We go to Gibbs. And they laughed. Like it was, it, it was, you know, it was tragically funny to them to be like, oh, yeah, we know a little bit. We go to Gibbs. Look at it. Look around. Where are the windows? Where are the flowers? Where's the trees? It's just high walls, bricks, mortar. And police. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, very little education anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's outside of that. Well, Is our light still on? Oh, yes. Uh, well, thank, thank you. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. Thank you. light in the dark. Thank you for all your work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. We you appreciate so it. All right. So this question's for uh, Mr. Nevins. Uh, I want to go back to the question I asked uh, Mr. Neville. Oh, Neville, sorry about that, when he was here earlier. Uh, and it does go back to money, and okay. uh, money in politics specifically. Yes. The, the city council's been debating this uh, ordinance of the Defend Our Democracy. And the question to you is, should the city move forward with an ordinance to abolish super PACs and limit foreign corporate spending and, and allow a greater diversity of participation in our political system? Well, I think um, one thing that has to be stated is that when we talk about foreign money in local elections, all big money needs to be considered as foreign money in these local elections. And <laughs> I am completely opposed to the reign of big money over the local political establishment in St. Petersburg, but I was suspicious of the, this ordinance because it came with the approval of Rick Kreisman. And Rick Kreisman himself, his campaign is backed by super PACs. His campaign is funded uh, sometimes to the tune of up to $25,000 with contributions from people like John Katzmatitis, the uh, New York real estate billionaire who just bought up an entire block of downtown St. Pete. So as long as Christman promises to, turn, to return that $25,000, then perhaps I would have a little bit more confidence that the Defend Our Democracy ordinance would actually rid the local political system of the corrupting influence of big money. I think it's gonna take something deeper than that. I think it's gonna take a revolutionary struggle to reclaim the city for the people and take power back in the hands of the people, starting with reparations to the black community. That's what will get rid of big money from the local political system. Well, get to, well. So then it sounds like, what you say <laughs> is that uh, Christ was trying to knock down the competition. Yeah, I think he's trying to score political points because he's not running again next time. He's running this time. This, ob this ordinance would not require him to turn back hit the donations that he's gotten for this election. Oh, wow. So I think wow. he's trying to just present himself as some kind of anti-establishment candidate, which is a joke. Nobody buys that. Right, right, right. right. Okay, so now here's a question that I have. And it has to do with economic development, okay? Um, what would you implement? What implementation would you do you have for effective economic development in the South Side? Okay. Okay. Because okay. as we've seen, as we've seen, we have brownfields that, that are out there, brownfields programs, and that are out there that have been used but probably not been used appropriately. We have a situation with the, the, the uh, environmental justice or injustice situation that's taking place. Um, what would you implement mm -hmm. in order to rectify what's happening here? Because quality of life in South St. Petersburg mm -hmm. just has not changed. 
Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's like you just can't catch a break. Mm-hmm. So please. Well, you know, that just want to say that the quality of life of Southside, and thank you for calling it Southside, it's not Midtown. Um, the quality of life for the Southside, for the black I'm community, that much, right? <laughs> for the black community in St. Pete, is it's not a coincidental type of relationship, and that you have um, a divided St. Pete where there is the downtown, the waterfront, and the white community that experiences wealth, and then you go into the Southside, the black community, and you see nothing but economic despair. That's not a coincidence. That's as a result of relation of a relationship built on the foundation of slavery of um, African people and the genocide of indigenous people. And that's the type of relationship that breeds a social system that we see today. So this whole divide is not a coincidence. It's as a result of what has happened. And what we intend to implement is something that our platforms are based on. We've been running on reparations to the black community. And reparations to the black community is so critical because it's, you're talking about, and there was a, a study done where it said that African people, it would take the average black household 228 years to catch up to the average white family. The black community does not have 228 years. You have to pay reparations to the black community for the stolen labor, for the stolen resource, for the stolen lives and stolen land. What does, because it, that, well, what does that look like? What that, does that, that look like? Yeah, that, right. I just want to make sure mm-hmm. we stay on track with that. I right. get that. We, we get that point, okay? Mm-hmm. What I want to know, and I, I, I think that what, what I think people want to hear mm-hmm. is what is the plan? What is the implementation mm-hmm. plan for that? Right, well, I mean, that work? it looks like centering and, you know, it looks like centering the budget around reparations and economic development to the black community. And it looks like I'm just... In terms of an example, what we've been talking about is the Tropicana Field Stadium. Right. And the Tropicana Field Dome, as it was mentioned by people before us, is it rests on what used to be the gas plant district, which was a historic black community, and it was destroyed um, to build a baseball dome before the city even had a baseball team. And it displaced 800 families and destroyed 100 black-owned businesses that existed there. And so an act of reparation to the black community is turning over that land that rests under the Tropicana Field back to the black community to build economic development, to build affordable housing for the black community, which in turn, you know, benefits the entire city, and that's just one specific act of okay, reparations. Okay, so you said one. Mm-hmm. So I hear black, 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 mm-hmm. reparations, reparations, right. economic for black people. Mm-hmm. St. Petersburg is, as a whole is less than 20% black. Okay. How does doing everything and centering the mm-hmm. economic development mm-hmm. around assisting black people, mm-hmm. how does that benefit the whole city? Is this a limited political view? Are you mm-hmm. only wanting to serve one portion of the population? Mm-hmm. How does helping black people help the whole city? And, and does it have a positive domino effect, so to speak? You well, know, yeah, just what, 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 what happens what, if, you, you know, if somebody says, Oh, we're gonna have a, and we're gonna center it on women. Wouldn't that exclude the whole men? So, so how is how is centering everything on black people mm-hmm. going to help the whole city? So that you look like you care about the whole city and not just helping black people. It's centering social and economic justice to the black community, and that uplifts the entire city because oppressing the black community hasn't done anything for the white community except I mean they've been able to build at our expense but what does that look like in turn where you have you know this whole thing in within the black community this despair this you know there's no possibility for a future and in turn white people are now experiencing the same uh, crisis as the black community when you're talking about homelessness when you're talking about gentrification when you're talking about police containment when you're talking about all these different things white people are now being affected by what the system has done to the black community so the white community has a stake in uniting with the black community have a stake in uniting with the black community and uniting with reparations and economic development for the black community that can uplift the entire city. Just speaking about Tropicana Field alone and building affordable housing on that land, that stands to deflate the housing costs throughout the entire city. So that- Wait, I'm sorry. So you said, say that again? It stands to deflate the housing costs for everyone through the entire city. So the white community has a stake in what we do in the black community, has a stake in reparations, has a stake in uniting and standing in solidarity. Okay, okay, so I know know some other folks listen and are probably uh, yeah, thinking the same, yeah, thinking the same thing right now. We have, we have a new phone call. Yeah, let's, let's hold, hold that for a minute. Let's go. Let's okay. get a phone call here. Right, real quick. Let's see what I have. Yeah, yeah. Wow. 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 This is a constituent from St. Peter's. Let's five minutes. Chris. So Chris, Chris, what's happening, Chris? I'm already here, man. Don't worry about it. Question. Go directly to your question, Chris. Hi, this is Chris Ponder in St. Petersburg. Hey, Chris. Yeah. And 
and uh, I just had a couple quick questions. What's your position on the water fluoridation issue in light of that it affects blacks seven times more negatively than other ethnicities, according to Dartmouth College study? And uh, uh, that's association of silico fluoride treated water with elevated blood lead, which also means that uh, lead and other toxic metals are more difficult to excrete, causing higher criminality, according to this Dartmouth College study uh, from 1999. And uh, if people were less unhealthy, that perhaps we could have more engaged and civically active people. Uh, there are many black leaders, who, including uh, the niece and daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, several others uh, who are who call it a civil rights issue. And uh, you look up uh, statements from black slash Hispanic leaders uh, for, for their statements on that. There's so, like I said, there's several more. I wish I had the time to go over that. Well, thank, you, thank you very much for your question. Can we let mayoral candidate um, Neville yes, answer that? Because yes. Kate's, before, yeah, Kate's came in and spoke at length about that issue, so it'll be good to hear another uh, mayoral position on that. Absolutely. Well, there's two things I would say to that. One, I, I'm not sure about this whole notion that fluoride in the water is the cause of quote-unquote criminality, because for one, I think you really have to be clear about what you're talking about when you say criminality. Um, is it fluoride in the water that led Kreisman to commit the criminal act of shutting down the Albert witted sewage plant and leaking 256 million gallons of sewage into the water? Was it fluoride in the water that led the sheriff's department this morning to kill three black teenagers in Palm Harbor or last year to kill to drown three uh, teenage black girls, Dominic Battle, Ashanti Butler, and Lanaya Miller. Um, I think that's the social system. But as far as lead in the water is concerned, the social system itself, because it's controlled by corrupt big money politicians who only have their own profit margins and bank accounts at heart, they will poison the people. They will do anything to the people as long as they can make a buck off of it. And in fact, Rick Baker, one of my opponents, in 2008 approved running a water transmission line through the dumping ground of a gun range resulting in lead poisoning the water of the people of St. Petersburg and of course Christman is notorious for dumping sewage in the water so both of these have, guys have got to go and we need to take back St. Petersburg for the people. Uh, legitimate, legitimate, legitimate uh, question. Now <laughs> you are running as opposition party candidates. If you win, you will be inserted into a system that is going to directly oppose everything that you're doing. Not maybe personally or politically, just systematically. The system is not built to address the issues that you are putting. But what, what is your specific strategy for going in and either readjusting the system, destroying the system, or having to work within the system because mm -hmm. everyone is employed to keep the system going? How can you possibly go in and, and affect change. Let's, let's, give, let's give a real quick 30 second answer if you can, okay? I know it's tough sometimes, but if you can do that, we'll, that'll be good. There's a revolution happening in the city of St. Pete, and it starts before we're even elected. And it has been building a people's movement against the system, against the status quo, so that the system can't operate in the same old way. That once we win these, off these political offices, we win um, as a result of the people putting us there and holding us accountable. And the system is going to be transformed. It is transforming. The people have demands. The people are, um, you know, holding us accountable to what it is that we're saying. We are fighting on behalf of the people. It starts before the election. It starts by building a people's movement against the system, against big money, against the status quo. And that's happening. And once we win, the entire system will be transformed. And that's going to reverberate not just in St. Pete, but throughout this entire country. Hey, listen, folks. This is how we do it on the Sunday Forum. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Candidate Interviews for St. Petersburg. This afternoon. Where can I find that information? Yeah, I'll see if I can find it for you. Okay, go ahead. All right, Dan. Thanks a lot. Because uh, I was told that the, there were no polls. And, Let me uh, see if I can find actually, it. what uh, what they're going on is how much the candidates have raised. So, so and, and the fact that Justin Neville wasn't at the debate last night proves that democracy is dead in this city. And Dan, uh, and you the know, money it rules supreme in this city. Dan, uh, the uh, the Uhuru's uh, sponsored uh, a protest last night at Williams Park. How many Absolutely. people? Did you how, how, that? how many people came to it? Uh, did you guys cover that? Yeah, uh, somebody you announced it yesterday here on WMNF when you called in. Okay, are you gonna are you gonna play uh, what Jesse has? How, how many people came to it? Uh, you know, you know how many people came to the uh, the debate last night that they weren't allowed to come. That uh, when people came to be the audience, 
to the debate. Uh, the Palladium told them that they were waiting on Bay News 9 to tell them about how, the, how they could receive tickets and, and that they should go home, but they can leave their name and their address or their phone number and they would be contacted later, but that wouldn't guarantee that they would receive tickets. And then they decided that the audience wouldn't be first come, first served uh, by the ticket box at the Palladium, but rather that, uh, that the audience would be uh, invitation only. Yeah, well, you know, then they decided that the invitation only would be done by the two, two candidates the, that you just called the leading candidate, Rick Baker, well, Dan, Dan, if you've got, Dan, if you've got other information, no, no, Dan, if you've got other information about who the leading candidates are, uh, if, let, let's say, let, let's say that Jesse Neville has a huge number of supporters. Um, uh, there were about, I, I, I watched the video last night of the gathering in Williams Park, and there were about 50 people at Williams Park last night uh, in support of him, and that's a nice crowd, but it's not a huge crowd. Um, do you? Uh, you know, do you seriously think that Jesse Neville, who who I've seen in the papers every day, I think he's going to be on, he's going to be on this radio station next week. Um, do you seriously think that that he's got a chance of winning? Absolutely. All right. Why? I I, I think we are, I think he is winning already. Okay. He, he's winning over the people because uh, people like Rick Prizman and Rick Baker and. And the the, uh, the two parties in this country are not listening to the people. Uh, they're requiring the televised debate where people can actually see this, and that's why we've been asking for access to the televised debate. And uh, what you said yesterday was uh, that you can go online and watch it. Well, not everybody has internet, and not everybody has TV either. But but um, yeah, uh, Jesse Neville it is already winning. And Dan, when, when and, we get uh, to when we get to August 29th, uh, how many? What percent of the vote do you think that uh, uh, Jesse Neville will have? I think he'll have a large portion of the vote. Like All right, so let, let's just say what percent of the vote. I mean, Jeff, you know, I'm sure he's working hard. I'm sure he's uh, going door to door in the neighborhoods. I'm sure that um, you know he's having a lot of events. Uh, you know, what percent of the vote do you think he's going to have uh, once we get to that night of the August primary? Um, I'm hoping he wins. You know, okay, so uh, so he'll have 51 percent of the vote outright. I can't speculate, but it's well, well, just give me a number, because you know I, um, you know I, I, I think it's really important that that uh, we kind of test your credibility, and and the night of uh, the primary, we look back on what you said, and and so give us the number. Is it 51 percent, 52 percent? Uh, uh, I, I've never said any percentage. Okay, well, well, just just give us a percentage right now. What, you know, uh, he he won't get below what? What would you say? You know, that's that's not the point. To no, I, I think the point is is that that um, uh, you know there are people taking polls out there, and Jesse Neville doesn't show up in the can the polls that the candidates are taking themselves. And I'm sure he's doing a great job going door to door and getting support. So I'm just wondering, what do you think, you know, at the end of the election, uh, at least the primary, what percent of the vote do you think he's going to get? Uh, the, uh, so say Pete polls is what you're saying, where you got your information from, right? Well, I'm going to have to look that up, but uh, okay. I've, talk, so I've, talked to, I've talked to, okay, I've talked to a bunch of people in St. Petersburg um, who uh, work for candidates. And uh, I'm told that there were some uh, polls taken, so that's what I'm basing it on. Okay, well, I'm not going to try and speak while you're speaking over me. I'm sorry. Well, I, you know, I just wonder, by the end of the primary at night, what percent of the vote uh, is Jesse going to get? Well, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm gonna... Well, I, I think it's a really important one, because if Jesse's going to win, uh, he's going to win by 51 or 52 or 53 percent. Um, you know, that's what it's going to take to win the primary. So, anyway. Uh, Dan, maybe maybe we should move on to the other things I want to talk about. Is that okay? Uh, may I may I please say one thing? Sure. Uh, it, uh, the the uh, uh, people are disenfranchised in this country. Uh, the people who are most affected by these issues that Jesse that Jesse is talking about the the constant police occupation in the black community and people see it. You know, it's 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 uh, it's, it's, it's sickening that people 
call areas like the South Side the ghetto. And, and, and you know, a lot of people do. But when people call for reparations, people scoff, you know, but where did they put the Jews? And, and those who are disenfranchised have lost their right to vote. And so those who are under constant police occupation and don't have a right to vote, and the only places where they can vote are places with heavy police presence, it makes it very difficult for people to exercise their right to democracy. So we have uh, taxation without representation uh, here in the city uh, uh, taking away felons' rights to vote. Now, that's a major issue. If Rick Carson was going to reopen Albert Witten, he would have never closed it down, and he would have already opened it. You know, Rick Baker did the same thing. He splashed homeless people's tents. He stole people's stuff. Uh, these, these two candidates don't care about the people. Jesse cares about the people, and he's winning them over. Okay, so, so he's going to be, uh, and, and Dan, thanks a lot. I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to get the show bogged down with just you as the only guest. But Dan, thanks a lot. For giving me so much time, Rob. All right, thanks. Please look up St. Pete Falls and let people know where I, they can I'm, find Paul. Hey, Dan, Dan, hey, Dan, 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 listen.